What if there was a drug that could actually slow down aging? For decades, rapamycin has shown incredible promise in extending lifespan in animal studies. Now the results of the first major human trial are in. Did it live up to the hype? That's the central question behind the Pearl Trial, a landmark study investigating the effects of rapamycin in people. For years, this drug has been hailed as the most successful longevity extending compound in preclinical research. But the big questions remain, is it safe for us? And does it translate to similar benefits in humans? The initial results of the Pearl trial were reported back in September 2024, and now the rigorous peer-reviewed findings have been officially published. This is the paper entitled The Influence of Rapamycin on Safety and Health Span Metrics After One Year, Pearl Trial Results, and it holds some fascinating insights that we're going to unpack in this video. So what exactly is the Pearl Trial? Its full name gives us a clue the participatory evaluation of aging with rapamycin for longevity study. The core mission of the study was twofold. First and foremost, it aimed to figure out if using low doses of rapamycin over the long term is safe. Secondly, the researchers wanted to see if rapamycin could actually do what animal studies suggested, which is slow down the aging process and improve crucial health span metrics in healthy older individuals. Now, Rapamycin is already FDA approved as an immunosuppressant, but in those cases, it's used at much higher doses and continuously. And with this kind of usage, some side effects have popped up. The big question the Pearl trial wanted to answer was, would we see the same side effects with a lower dose taken less frequently? The trial was crowdfunded and run in a decentralized manner. That means regular people like you and me contributed to making this research happen. However, it was still a properly randomized and placebo controlled study, the gold standard for scientific research. The results we're looking at today cover a period of 48 weeks, which is almost a full year. And finally, what were they measuring? The primary outcome they were most interested in was changes in visceral fat. That's the dangerous fat around organs but they also kept a close eye on a whole range of secondary outcomes, including things like bone mineral density, lean tissue mass, any adverse events that occurred, and all the usual blood markers you get checked, like HbA1c, lipid panels, indicators of kidney and liver function. So a quite a comprehensive look at both safety and potential benefits. The study enrolled participants aged between 50 and 85 years. While the average age for the entire group wasn't specified. The average age within each of the three treatment arms was approximately 61 or 62 years old. The cohort consisted of 114 individuals with 40 women and 71 men who were randomly assigned to one of three groups. Five milligrams of rapamycin per week, 10 milligrams of rapamycin per week, or a placebo. Midway through the trial, an important finding emerged the compounded rapamycin used in the study exhibited lower bioavailability com compared to the commercially available version. Subsequent testing indicated that the compounded formulation delivered roughly one third of the expected serum levels after 24 hours. This suggests that the effective doses were approximately 1.65 milligrams and 3.3 milligrams for the intended 5 milligram and 10 milligram weekly doses, respectively. The use of the compounded version appears to have been necessitated by the need for identical placebo capsules, which were not available for the commercial rapamycin formulation. So what did the Pearl trial actually find? Let's look at the key results. Regarding the primary outcome, which was the change in visceral fat, the study did not find any statistically significant differences between the rapamycin and placebo groups. Therefore, we won't show a graph for that measure. There was an interesting significant finding where it came to lean muscle mass in women. Specifically, women in the 10 milligram rapamycin per week group experienced a notable increase. At the 24 week, they had gained an average of about two and a half percent. And by the end of the 48 week study, they had reached about five and a half percent. Interestingly, the five milligram rapamycin group did not see the same significant increase suggesting that there might be a dosage threshold 
to this effect. Now let's look at the bone mineral density. Across the entire five milligram rapamycin group, the researchers observed a statistically significant decrease in the typical age-related loss of bone mineral density. However, this effect did not reach statistical significance when the data was analyzed separately for men and women. So it does not appear on this graph. Another interesting finding from the trial relates to participants' self-reported health and well-being, which was measured using the widely recognized tool called the SF36 questionnaire. The SF36 is a comprehensive survey consisting of 36 questions that delve into various aspects of a person's health status, including physical functioning, emotional well-being, social functioning, energy levels, and importantly for our discussion here, pain. It provides a standardized way to assess an individual's perception of their own health and how it impacts their daily life. Results showed that the women in the 10 milligram rapamycin per week group reported a significant reduction in pain over the course of the year. To provide a complete picture of the findings, a few other points from the paper. The male participants taking the five milligrams weekly dose of rapamycin saw an increase in red blood cell count. Another observation was an increase in blood urea nitrogen for the male participants in the 10 milligram rapamycin group. BUN is a blood marker that can indicate kidney function. While an increase doesn't automatically mean kidney damage, it's a change that would warrant careful monitoring in longer term studies. The study also looked at the gut microbiome in the male participants taking the 10 milligram dose, there was an indication of increased gut dysbiosis. Gut dysbiosis refers to an imbalance in the types and amounts of bacteria in the gut, which can sometimes be associated with negative health outcomes. In the women, there was a trend towards an increased gut permeability, sometimes referred to as leaky gut. However, these findings did not reach the threshold for statistical significance. On a positive note, the study found no significant difference in the number of adverse events reported between the rapamycin groups and the placebo group, suggesting that at the weekly dosages used in the trial, rapamycin appeared to be generally well tolerated over the one year period. And finally, the researchers also assessed epigenetic aging clocks, and they found no significant difference in these between the rapamycin and the placebo groups after one year. So what are our key takeaways from the PEARL trial? While we didn't see the dramatic clear-cut benefits some might have hoped for based on the preclinical data, the researchers themselves offer some important context. Firstly, the study involved relatively small group sizes, which can make it harder to detect smaller but potentially real effects. Secondly, the issue with the compounded rapamycin likely meant that the participants weren't receiving the intended doses which could have impacted the results. Another crucial point to consider is the health status of the participants. They were generally quite healthy with low BMIs. This raises an interesting question. Would a less healthy population potentially see more pronounced benefits from rapamycin? While that's a possibility, it also makes you wonder if you're already prioritizing a healthy lifestyle, how much additional impact would rapamycin realistically have? Despite these nuances, the PEARL trial is a significant step forward. Rapamycin remains one of the most promising drugs we have in the aging research field, yet human data is still very limited. The fact that the trial was conducted and published is invaluable, and I really applaud the people who put this together. What we really need now are more studies to gather further data on both the safety and efficacy of rapamycin in humans as well as to pinpoint optimal dosing strategies. This will be crucial in determining if and for whom rapamycin might be beneficial intervention in promoting healthy aging. Thank you for taking the time to delve into the PEARL trial with me, and I will speak to you again.